Let us resume the public worship of God, and we do so as we sing in Psalm 40. We're going to sing from the beginning of the psalm. Well, let's sing it to you. Psalm 40. Um, yeah, the beginning of the psalm, a psalm of personal testimony. I waited for the Lord my God, patiently did bear. At length to me he did incline my voice and cry to hear. Down to the double verse, at the end of the double verse five, I waited. Oh my God. I waited for
We continue, O Lord, in the presence of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We continue in worship, confessing again, as we have done already today, our sin. Though we have added to the sins of this morning, we add every day, because no mere man since the fall is able perfectly to keep the commandments of God, but doth daily break them in thought, word, and deed. We confess that that is true for ourselves, that we do not have to find some notorious person in the world to label them a sinner, that the label applies to us all, and with the label comes consequences, eternal consequences. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. And what a dying that is, and what a death that is, who can dwell with everlasting burnings. O oh Lord our God, we acknowledge that we are poor, hell-deserving creatures, and that that is our natural destiny. And that if we arrive there, we can utter not a word of complaint. Particularly if we have been under the preaching of the gospel and close to the things of God. Our doom is particularly sad and particularly uh, severe. Help us, eternal one, then this evening, all of us, each one of us, to draw near with true hearts, to draw near with desire to know and to meet with the living God, to come with true confession of sin, true repentance for it, and a genuine heart seeking and heart thrust in the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray again, eternal Lord, for blessing upon our homes and families, Upon our congregation and upon the anticipated visit of Mr. Morrison over the coming days, we pray, Lord, that he would be brought here safely and preserved in health whilst he is here. And that even the weather itself and the outward elements would be favorable. And that he would find hearts opened and doors opened and ground ready for the sowing of the gospel. We grant, O Lord, that as he sows, though some may fall among stony places and into the thorn break and on the path, that others will fall into good ground. We pray, Lord, for blessing then upon us, how we need it. To that end, bless the gospel as it goes out in the community, every piece of literature that will be given, every word that will be said every invitation that will be issued. We pray, Lord, for days of blessing. The gospel is among us. It is always among us, but it is among us in a particular way at such a time as this. We pray, eternal one, for uh, all that we know and all that we love. We pray for those who are unwell and we remember them in a particular way, praying for healing, and improvement where that is the Lord's will and for patience and grace and blessing where prolonged illness is what lies ahead. We commit to Lord our he cares denominationally, the whole denomination. We pray for all our congregations at home in this country, across the Atlantic, in France and Spain and Sri Lanka. We pray for the work of the gospel through out the Middle East, under the auspices of the Middle East Reform Fellowship and other like organizations. We think of the work in uh, Northern Kenya. We think of the broadcasting ministry, and we give thanks for the technology which makes it possible to broadcast the good news of Christ across Africa and into the Middle East. Remember the work in Cyprus under 
the direction of mirth. We pray for those who are engaged there directly and others who assist. And as we pray for the Islamic world, we must not forget those who are eh, prior to them, the children of Abraham. We pray, Lord, for the Isaacs of our own day and generation. Eh, they have an outward form, but what is the form without Christ? We pray for blessing upon those who seek to reach them with the gospel. Remember, Lord, we pray the church under the heel of persecution, those who are imprisoned, those who are even tortured, those who are separated from their families, and those who as yet are none of these things, but live with constant fear. Remember those who cannot openly share the gospel, not even with loved ones. They have a loneliness that we cannot even begin to imagine. But no doubt they have an upholding too in the midst of it all. It's in the day, Lord, when those who are forced in secret can proclaim in public. And hasten the day when brutal regimes are either transformed or removed under the hand of God. We know that it is in this world that God judges nations. We see many nations ripe for judgment and we do not have to look beyond our own. We confess, O oh Lord, the sins of the nation. And how they, how they come in upon ourselves, how casual we become about them, how used we become to things, how ready we are to moderate according to the times, and how wrong that is. Forgive us our casualness, our lack of zeal, our lack of resilience, our lack of faith in the living God, our lack of love to others. Our obsession at times with ourselves, our focus upon ourselves, how different to the one whose focus was on others and whose aim was always ministry. Give us ministering hearts, in whatever place the Lord has placed us. Help us to minister, Lord, with diligence. And give us hearts that seek out opportunity to serve. Remember, Lord, all that is confronted and is before us even over these days as we think of that momentous period in the reign of our queen 70 years many years and we give thanks lord for the great measure of peace and harmony that has been a feature of our national life over these years and as she ponders these things herself we pray that it would be blessed to her and that our thoughts would turn to another king whom we must all meet and we will meet him on the one level there's no royalty, there's no nobility, there's no titles. We meet him as sinners. And if we are to meet him in peace, we must meet him as sinners saved by grace. Remember those who join us online. We pray, Lord, for them wherever they might be. And we commit to all who share in the worship today to the grace of the Lord. Hear us now. Receive us for Jesus' sake. He is the Lamb of God. He is Emmanuel, God with us. He is our only hope tonight. But what a hope that is. We have thought of it already this day. The one who was baptized by John. The washing away of sin. Though he had no sin, he is made sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And the one who received that heavenly commendation that voice and that dove 
and all oh, that temptation and the wild animals. What a world he came into. But how he transforms it by his grace. Blessed be his name. Hear us for his sake. Cleanse us, receive us, unite us, guard us, guide us as we come to the word. And all we ask through him. Amen. We're going to read together now in God's word and we're going to read in the New Testament scriptures and in the gospel according to Matthew in chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. And I read from verse 1. When they drew nigh to Jerusalem and were come to Bethpage to the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught to you, you shall say, The Lord hath need of them. And straightway he will send them. All this was done that it might be that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the foal of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt. And put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. And said unto them, it is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer. But you have made it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were so displeased. And said to him, Hearest thou what he say? Jesus saith unto them, yeah, Have you never read? Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, thou hast perfected praise. And so often, trust the Lord to follow with his blessing that reading of his word. This is the second time that Jesus cleaned the temple or cleared it from unscrupulous people. He did it at the beginning of his ministry and here he is at the very end of his ministry and he's doing the same thing. How often he needs to cleanse, sweep away. We're going to sing now in Psalm 5. Psalm 5, we're going to sing from the beginning. Stephen, would you just sing it please? Um, Psalm 5 at the beginning, give ear unto my words, O Lord, my meditation way. Hear my loud cry, my King, my God, for I to thee will pray. And so on. Down to verse 8, give ear unto my words, O Lord. <clears throat> 
Seeking the light of God's Spirit on His Word, we turn now to the Acts of the Apostles in chapter 5 as we continue our consideration of this part of God's Word. The Acts of the Apostles, chapter 5, last Lord's Day, we looked at verses 1 through 11. We come tonight to verse 12 through 16. Acts 5 and at verse 12. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. 
And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. And of the rest, durst no man joined himself to them, but the people magnified them. And believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes, both of men and women, and so much that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about Jerusalem, bringing sick folks, and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed, every one. Well, last Lord's Day, we considered together that very solemn passage at the beginning of the chapter where we have the incident with Ananias and Sapphira. And incidentally, um, that event is a reminder to us that there is no perfect church in this world. People sometimes go around looking for perfect church. I think it was Spurgeon who said once that if he found it, he would he would join it and it would immediately become an imperfect church because he was there. Um, it simply does not exist in this world. It didn't exist even in the days of the apostles, let alone our day. They had their problems. There will always be difficulties that crop up. There will always be difficulties because, first of all, the enemy is active. Secondly, the mature Christian, even the mature Christian, is still only a sinner saved and kept by grace. And thirdly, the church in this world is always a mixed state. There's always tares growing with the wheat. Well, now in verse 12, the narrative moves on. And here we find Luke giving us, in a very few verses, a great deal of general detail. In verses 1 to 11, Luke gave us the details of one incident. Now here in these next verses, he is painting, as they say, with broad strokes. There's no reference to any individuals except Peter himself. Nobody else is mentioned. That will come again in the next section from verse 17. Indeed, the verses that we are at here tonight, they form a kind of bridge between what happened in verses 1 to 11 and what's recorded for us in the verses that follow from 17 onwards. Well, without further ado, I want to come to these verses and we see at least four things here. I say at least because there's more than that, but I'm going to focus on four. And what are the four? Well, first of all, there's an advancing of the work. There's an advancing of the work, the work of Christ, the work of his church, the work of the gospel. It is advancing. In verses 12 through 16, Luke is giving us a summary statement of the advancing work of the church in these days. And it is a very encouraging summary. And it is all the more encouraging because these verses come immediately after the solemn verses, the solemn judgment, in fact, that was recorded for us in the opening verses of the chapter. Ananias and Sapphira both under the hand of God, are ushered very suddenly into eternity. And we might have thought that because of that, the church would be emptied, or at the very least, that the advance of the gospel would be halted, and that an event like this would lead to a huge setback in the work of the church. But that's not the way it was at all. Luke records for us that the church was not emptied, 
In fact, it kept on filling up. And many people were told in, in verse 14, believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes of men and women, multitudes were brought in to the gospel. Many were attracted to it and were saved gloriously by the power and the grace of God. Now, how can we explain this? It seems to, to go against the natural grain of things. How can we explain this advance in the light of what looked like a very severe setback? Well, obviously, this goes without saying, but I better say it anyway. Obviously, God's spirit was at work. Without that, there's no advance anyway. But apart from that, in the events of verses 1 through 11, God had shown these people that he was real. He had shown them that he was real, that he was holy, that he was righteous, that he was not to be trifled with, that he was not to be lied to, that he was not to be deceived in any way. It was not to be pretended with. The events of verses 1 to 11, startling and, and, and shaking as they are, had demonstrated that the Christian faith wasn't a fraud. It was real. <laughs> it was shockingly real. And there were no doubt many among them who were shaken by this. I'll say more about that maybe later on. But it gave them serious thought. As they thought to themselves, oh, if this is what the Lord is like. If he marks iniquity like this, who will stand? And multitudes were added to the kingdom. They saw the solemnity, the holiness of God. But there's something else in the advance of this work as well. Not only does the work advance, even in the midst of these difficulties and perhaps through these difficulties, but there's something else. There's another element in these verses that I want to draw your attention to. And it's alluded to in verse 13 at the end of the verse. Men and women were attracted to the gospel. Were awed in the presence of God, yes. But they were told that they were also attracted to these Christian people. These believers that were there at that time there was something very attractive about them. What was it that was so attractive? Well, they practiced what they preached. What they professed was what they lived. There was a genuineness. There was an authenticity about them that spoke volumes. And those of them who had been converted from maybe particularly godless lives. They shone with a brightness and a clarity that everybody saw. And people would be talking about it. They say, have you seen the change that's come into the life of such and such a person in Jerusalem or one of the other towns? You know, there must be something in the gospel. Only the Lord could change that person. Only the Lord could work in his life, in her life, in such a way. And some people, of course, would have been skeptical and they'd have said, oh, it's a flash in the pan and it'll be over soon enough and they'll be back to their old ways. What a responsibility then fell on these young believers to walk with the Lord and to walk carefully. It's the eyes of the world was upon them. It's John Calvin who says, there's a certain majesty in sincere godliness. And there is, isn't there, 
a certain majesty in sincere godliness. There's something about a godly life. There's something about a consistent life that attracts men and women and that even others who are not drawn perhaps to the gospel are forced to acknowledge that there's something real about it all. They looked at them and they said, these people aren't acting. This is real. These people haven't just embraced some new idea. There's something life-changing about this. Their desires are different. Their attitudes and reactions are different. How they speak is different. How they conduct themselves is different. They're not just dragging themselves to, 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 to church out of a sense of duty. They seem to like it. They seem to love it. They seem to want it. They're hungering and thirsting, as Jesus says, after righteousness. And they're being filled. And people saw that. And the people they were working with saw that. And the people in their family saw that. And the people on the street saw that. And multitudes were at it. People magnified them in verse 13. This is real. They saw, for example, that they were honest people. That age, like our own age, was, was a dishonest one. How important that is. You know, the same was true in the days of the Babylonian Empire. Who do they promote in the book of Daniel? Why, it's, it's Daniel and his friends. They're promoted to high office because they could be trusted. They could be depended on. They were reliable. They were straight in a crooked world. I was reminded recently that before the Roman Empire turned its fire on the Christian church, many of its leaders promoted Christians, promoted them to important office in the empire. Why? Because they saw that they were decent people, that you could trust these people with money, that you could trust them with, with women and children. Oh, it wasn't because they were born good. None of us are born good. We're all born bad. We're all born sinners. It's because they were born again. Christian, that's the responsibility that now falls on your shoulders. What a blessing if, if people see us and if they look at us and they see something of this. said, um, I think it was John Bunyan, wasn't it, that, that speaks of before he was converted. Doesn't matter if it, it wasn't Bunyan, the point is still the same anyway. But uh, of, of uh, there was a group of, I think it was older ladies. They were older in his eyes anyway, he was young at the time. But, um, and they were, there was something about them. Just the way they were, and he was attracted to them. And at first he didn't understand why. Ah, we'll catch more with honey than with vinegar. What a blessing if people see us like this. So there's an advancing of the work. And what lay at the heart of that advance? What was really at the very, very center of that. It wasn't just the Christian um, a witness. It wasn't just the results of that solemn judgment. What was at the very heart of this advance? Was it the miracles? Well, I'll come to the miracles in a minute. But you know what lay at its heart was the preaching of God's word. That's how multitudes were at it. The preaching of God's word, 
accompanied by the power of God's spirit. And when you bring these two together, then multitudes are added. And souls are saved and lives are changed. And the gospel advances. The preaching of the word. We, there's always a danger of downplaying the preaching of the word. And we live in a day when there is a, a sort of dismissing of the preaching of the word. I've heard people say the day of preaching is gone. What nonsense. It's no more gone now than it was gone in the days of Noah. Noah. Because the preaching of the word is the principal means that God has ordained. That's why the greater part of our worship is taken up with the preaching and exposition of the word. And that's to be done clearly. That's to be done faithfully. That's to be done seriously and solemnly. Well, we find them in verse 12. Look at the end of the verse there. They were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. What was Solomon's porch? It was a very large area that was part of the temple precincts. And the authorities allowed them at this time to gather there for fellowship. And we believe also for the act of worship and for the preaching of the word. Now that seems strange to us, doesn't it? Why were they tolerated? Well, obviously God inclined the hearts of the authorities to tolerate them. To an extent and for a time, it had tolerated Christ himself. He was often in Solomon's porch. He was often taking the opportunity to meet with people there and expound the word. And, and the Lord ordained things so that that opportunity was given. You know, everybody's heart, the heart of all men is in God's hand. And he can turn it whichever way he wishes. And for a time, he, he seems to do that. And they're gathering there in Solomon's porch. They're singing the praise of God. They're praying to the Lord. The word of God is being explained and expounded. They're encouraging each other in the things of God. And every time they came, there's new people, new faces. And they're hearing that so-and-so has come to the Lord and so-and-so and the next person too. You know, there's something very significant about the church, the New Testament church being gathered there in Solomon's porch. One of the last public acts of Jesus, we read about it in Matthew 21, was to sweep out of there the con men and the thieves who were tolerated by the authorities. And in fact, encouraged by them because they made money out of it. My father's house, he said, it was to be a house of prayer. You have made it a den of thieves. But now, now there in Solomon's porch, we find those who again have made it a house of prayer. We find men and we find women offering true worship to God in the spirit through Christ. They were the real temples, weren't they? We saw that on Wednesday evening. We were thinking of, of the, the believer indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And they're living out the truth in these very buildings which had for centuries declared the promise of Messiah. In Solomon's porch, they gather together. Ah, there's an advancing of the work. But did you notice, before I leave this, did you notice that some folk held back? Verse 13. And of the rest, there's no man join himself to them. And a bit of a debate over the years about that phrase, but I don't think we need to complicate it over much. It means what it says. Some simply did not join with them. Many did. But not everyone did. And 
it's still the same. Why? Well, there were probably lots of reasons. Possibly some of those who, who didn't join with them were frightened of what others would say. They acknowledged they were good people, but they're keeping a distance. Not so long ago in the gospel accounts, we're, we're told about those who were put out of the synagogue for their association with Jesus. Maybe they were frightened of that. Possibly there were genuine secret disciples among them who really loved the Lord, but who lacked the courage to, to declare that openly. And if that was so, they lost out on it. Imagine the blessings they lost because they didn't fully join themselves with the people of God. It's always a mistake. We always encourage those who are secret disciples to attach themselves to the things of God as much as they can. You'll benefit from it, and so will everybody else. Don't keep back. Don't hold aloof. The Christian faith is anything it is. It is a source of mutual encouragement and edification and help. Well, they kept back. Whatever the reasons. Are you keeping aloof? Are you keeping aloof? Well, there's a day coming. And there'll be no place for that. It's one or other. And a great division will be made and no one will simply hang on on the fringes. It's all or nothing. Well, there's an advancing of the work. Secondly, and more briefly, there's a multiplying of signs. There's a multiplying of signs. Verse 12, by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. By the hands of the apostles, if you notice, they are the principal agents of these signs and wonders, and that is no surprise for us. And we're given in verse um, 15 one example of this. It appears that Peter's shadow had healing properties. They, they were putting people on the street in the hope that Peter's shadow would fall upon them. Now, there are those who dismiss this as superstition. And they say, these people have fallen into a horrible superstition. But there's no suggestion in the verse that it's, it's superstition. Remember, the apostles were granted great power. And a lot of their ministry mirrored that of their savior. And doesn't this incident remind us of the woman reaching out in the crowd to touch the hem of his garment? The power of Christ was at work. Chapter 1 and verse 8, what did he say to them? You shall receive power after Pentecost. You will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem. Let's not limit the power of God. He is laying the foundations of the New Testament church. These men, these apostles, had extraordinary gifts and skill. There's a multiplying of signs. It struck me this week as I was thinking about all of this. In verses 1 to 11, there is one sign. And it's an awful sign. It's a special judgment. In verses 12 to 16, there are thousands of signs. One is an act of judgment. The thousands are acts of mercy. And doesn't that balance it out? You know, there are those who will read the, these verses, this chapter, and they'll say, well, there you go. The, what sort of God is he? He strikes people dead. Yes, he does. Our, our breath is in his hands. But they fail to see what this is saying. 
If you come to the Bible with a critical eye, you'll find something to criticize anyway. There's, a, there's something about proportion here. One act of judgment. Thousands of acts of grace. Oh, is he not slow to anger and plenteous in mercy? Doesn't this tell us that? And so they are left with no excuse. Those who, who were aloof, they said, well, we're not sure about it. There's another sign. There's another miracle. Just like us, there's no excuse. That leads me to my third feature. There's an advancing of the work. There's a multiplying of signs. Thirdly, there's a healing of bodies. Verse 15. They're bringing the sick into the streets on beds and couches. It's just as it was at the time of Christ's own ministry. The people crowded in upon him. Sometimes he could scarcely move with the crowd. He said to them, I will give you power. The works that I do, you shall do, and greater works than these shall you do, because I go to my Father. And here we see the evidence for that. There's a healing of bodies, no doubt of minds too. We're told about uh, those who had um, evil spirits and unclean spirits and so on. These miracles were both acts of mercy and evidence that the message was true. Did you notice what it says at the end of verse 16? They were healed, everyone. Everyone. No failure. No one was sent home having been scolded that they didn't have enough faith to be healed. Now, there are those who, who would purport to be uh, miracle workers of our day and that's what they tell the people. They say, come back again next week with your crutches and we'll have another try. That's not what we have here. They're all here. Every single one of them. I said last week that God seems to judge sin more severely at new stages in, in the history of his church. New stages of church history. And he seems to. We, we saw that last week. I'm not going to go back over it. But it also appears that he gives special signs at the beginning of a new era. The Bible isn't full of miracles from Genesis to Revelation. I've given you the figures not that long ago, and they are significant, but they are not, as we would put it, huge. Most of them are concentrated in the three years of the Lord's ministry. There are a great proportion of them, at least. When God is beginning a new era, a new period in the work of his church, he seems to accompany it with miracles. You find very little by way of miracle in the book of Genesis. But in Exodus, which is the beginning of a new substantial era. The nation is being established. The church is being established. The priesthood is being established. There at the beginning of that new era, we find a cluster of miracles, one after another. Warren Wearsby puts it like this. Each time God opened a new door, in the work of redemption, he called men's attention to it. It's his way of saying, follow these leaders. 
because God, because I have sent them. I think that's very helpful. Here he is, it's a new era. Laying the foundation of the New Testament church. It's only going to be laid once. And it's accompanied by this cluster of members. Does God still perform miracles? Yes, he performs miracles every day in answers to prayer. But now with the complete word of God, we test Christian teachers, not by the miracles they perform, but by the message that they preach. And that leads me to my fourth feature. An advancing of the work, a multiplying of signs, a healing of bodies, and most importantly, there's a saving of souls. Verse 14. And believers were the more added to the Lord. This is the greatest miracle of all. This is the greatest miracle of all. Not the healing of bodies, not, not the healing of bodies by the shadow of Peter. This is far more astounding. And a lost sinner on the way to hell is stopped in their tracks when that lost sinner becomes a child of God. What a miracle that is. A miracle of God's grace and God's power. I'm not ashamed, says the apostle in Romans 1.16, of the gospel of Christ. Why, Paul? Because it is the power of God to salvation to everyone that believes. When a man or a woman is convicted by the Holy Spirit of their need of Christ and of their sin, when a man or a woman is persuaded by the Spirit to embrace Christ as he's freely offered in the gospel, when a man or a woman is delivered from the enslavement of sin, that's a miracle. That's a miracle. And it's a miracle that only God can do. No apostle can do that. No minister can do that. What did we begin the service with? He took me from a fearful pit and from the mighty clay. And on a rock, he set my feet. He put a new song in my mouth. He, he, he. Before it was me, me, me. That gives way to he, him, him. To God be the glory. Great things he has done. People will sometimes say, well, if I saw the miracles that they saw then, I would be persuaded. You think? I don't think so. Supposing you saw the greatest miracle in the world. Without the power of God, the transforming power of God, it would leave you the same old person that you were before the miracle. There were people there that saw the resurrection of Christ. There were people there that saw the resurrection of Lazarus. And that was beyond dispute. There was a crowd there that day. They saw it with their own eyes. And what does it tell us? It tells us that some of them went straight from there to the authorities to complain. Miracles in themselves separated from the word of God, separated from the transforming work of the spirit, 
You know what they'll do? They'll eventually leave you harder than you were at the beginning. That's the effect of love. It's actually quite frightening. But this miracle of the saving of souls, it comes through the preaching of the word of God. And the word is here. You don't need a miracle. The word is here. And through it, Christ is calling you. Yes, you. And as folks heard of what had happened to Ananias and Sapphira, some of them are saying, that could have been me. How can I have peace with God? How can I be ready for eternity? So while some of them kept aloof, they didn't, they couldn't. There's a saving of souls. The healing of their bodies was a great blessing. The miracles they saw was a great privilege. But this was a far greater blessing. Blessed are those, he says to Thomas, who have not seen, but have believed. Show me a sign, you say. Show me another sign. You'll never get enough signs. You'll ask the Lord for and he'll give it to you. And you'll persuade yourself that it's, it's just, it just happens. It's a coincidence. But no such thing as coincidence anyway. Under God's government. You want another one. Another. Friends. You put your trust in Christ, not in any of these outward things. Don't be, don't be focused on the wrong things. Don't be hankering after the wrong things. You say, well, I need that. No, you need Christ. And if you have Christ, you have everything you need. The salvation of their soul, somebody has said, Meets the greatest need, lasts the longest time, and costs the greatest price. May God bless his word. Let's pray. Now we give thanks for the salvation of souls, which does meet the greatest need. That is our greatest need. Meet us in our need. And we believe, too, that it lasts the longest time, for it is eternal. Where he begins a good work, he will perfect it in the day of Christ. And it costs the greatest price. Oh, what it costs. We were reminded already, O oh Lord, today of that. The one who is without sin must be numbered with the transgressor. And must carry the burden and the guilt and the shame. But oh, he has done it successfully. The second Adam has been tested in temptation. And he has triumphed. And because I live, he says, you shall live also. Go before us into the week. Cover our sin, guard and keep, and prepare us for all that's prepared for us, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Psalm 19 and at verse 7. 19 and at 7, we're going to sing from 7 through 11, five stanzas. God's law is perfect and converts. God's law is perfect and converts.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion and fellowship of God the Holy Spirit, I stand and abide with you all now and forevermore. Amen.